Here we've got the cancellation and rebirth of Johannes Price by Brendan P. Bartholomew. The Berlinetta, like all modern cars, could drive itself. But Johannes Price had turned off even the most basic forms of driver assist. This would be the last time Price drove the staggeringly expensive sports car, and he didn't want automatic braking, lane departure warnings, or electronic traction control diluting the experience. Price drove down Interstate 280 with gusto, but kept his speed below 90 miles per hour for most of the journey. Getting pulled over by the California Highway Patrol would have cost time he couldn't afford. Though this crisis was terrifying, Price took some pleasure in how rapidly he was responding. It had been about midnight when his assistant brought the matter to his attention. Now, less than three hours later, Price was about to escape the rapidly developing nightmare. Price had set his assistant to keep track of any instance of his name appearing in the news or on social media. Sentient machines were still a pipe dream, but the assistant had been smart enough to code the situation as a likely public relations disaster and awaken him with an urgent alert. Groggy at first, Price had become fully awake when he realized what he was seeing. A political opinion site called Opinio displayed an image of Price's face. The origin of the photo had not been immediately apparent, but it appeared to be a still image from a low-quality video. The accompanying headline read, True Mathematics Exec Delivers Drunken Racist Tirade. Under this was a blog post from an author identified as Nasty Michelle. The text read, this Silicon Valley Veep is canceled. In this exclusive video from a confidential source, True Mathematics Chief Marketing Officer, Johannes Price outs himself as a huge racist. The article went on to describe the video's contents and provenance. Price's blood had turned to ice as he played the video. I am a Malthusian. Price said, looking directly into the camera. Do you know what that is? He had not, of course, realized he'd been looking into a camera. The constant movements made it obvious this was a piece of wearable tech, hiding in plain sight on the face of the woman he'd been addressing. What a fool he'd been. A friend had introduced him to her at Byzantine a San Francisco nightclub that possessed underground credibility, yet offered a VIP lounge where semi-public figures like Price could party in semi-privacy. What had her name been? Chloe or Zoe? But Price couldn't remember which. She'd been at least 15 years his junior, and he'd felt powerfully attracted to her. He'd liked that she wore a round piece of jewelry in the center of her forehead, in flagrant disregard of those who called it cultural appropriation for a white woman to wear a bindi. The decoration had gone nicely with the girl's earrings and sari-like outfit, but Price realized now the bindi had contained a pinhole camera. What a fool he'd been. Chloe, or Zoe, had feigned ignorance of Price's public persona, pretending to be mostly unfamiliar with Price and his company, and she'd seemed so interested in his unique worldview. She'd drawn him out, somehow subtly broaching the right topics, so he would feel safe and encouraged. But how could she have known? Price's contributions to certain political campaigns were a matter of public record, as were his guest appearances on controversial podcasts and AM talk radio programs. But Price had always been careful to portray himself as being in the mainstream, giving no hint regarding his true allegiance. Yet this girl had been on more than a random fishing expedition, it was now clear she'd known what she'd been looking for. Had Price been careless? 
Had there been a leak? Had some member of the racially conscious groups he belonged to secretly been an infiltrator? Those questions would remain mysteries, as would Chloe, Zoe's true identity. Soon it wouldn't matter. Price exited the freeway in the hills above Menlo Park. The exit became a large sweeping right turn requiring motorists to complete a clockwise loop before merging onto eastbound Sand Hill Road. Price savored the G-forces pulling him sideways as he rounded the loop at an aggressive speed. In about a minute, he was driving past the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, home of the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Not much of the storied campus was visible from the road, especially at night, but Price could feel the facility's presence, and it stung. Price's title at True Mathematics did not adequately convey the pivotal role he'd play at the company. The founders were brilliant, but socially inept. It had been Price who'd helped them forge formal and informal working relationships with SLAC and other organizations, enabling a cross-pollination of ideas between those entities and the burgeoning startup. For all intents and purposes, he was a founder too. Price could not pretend to truly understand atomic solid state or elementary particle physics, but he'd had the audacity and people skills to get his founder scientists in the same rooms as the researchers and venture capitalists who could help them change the world. And now it's all coming to an end. Price would never again be welcome in SLAC's offices or laboratories. What a fool he'd been. As Price continued east, he'd replayed the video in his mind. He'd already been tipsy when he'd met the girl, and he'd ordered bottle service at the dark corner booth in which they were soon ensconced. Price had wanted to be intimate with Chloe or Zoe, and he understood now his wishful thinking and her guile had enabled him to believe there was intimacy and connection where there hadn't been. When the conversation turned to the topic of race, the woman's baiting of Price had been so subtle he still wasn't sure who'd broached the subject, not even after watching the video. What was clear was Price had well and truly screwed himself. Sipping extravagantly priced cognac, Price had enjoyed too much the sound of his own voice as he'd shared the forbidden truths he would have never stated in the presence of a radio host, podcaster, or journalist. The girl had given Price rapt attention as he'd expounded on his theories of racial science, explaining survival pressures had not vanished simply because humans had moved from hunting and gathering to living in cities. The welfare state has created a permanent underclass, Price said at one point in the video. And you have to understand, for the members of this class, unwed teen pregnancy is a successful reproduction strategy if you reproduced early and often, Price had told his big-eyed new friend, it didn't matter if your poor life choices, low intelligence, or lack of resources shortened your life expectancy. All that mattered was enough of your offspring survived long enough to make babies of their own. Natural selection rewards this behavior, Price had told her. To be honest, Talking to her about making babies had excited him. Had Price merely spoken in general terms about social Dar Darwinist concepts and the writings of Thomas Robert Malthus, it might have been possible to recover from this, to hire a crisis communications consultant to put some kind of benign spin on things while Price issued an apology, pledged to do better, and launched an initiative to help disadvantaged urban youth. But Price had been drunk, and he'd felt safe in the presence of that adorable, approving girl, and he'd let it all out. Price had specifically named the racial groups involved in the dynamic he'd been describing. 
In so doing, he'd left no doubt his ideas were not just a matter of economics or sociology. Price had revealed himself unambiguously as a white nationalist with who regarded low-income Black people as a burden to society. And as the conversation had worn on, Price had further disclosed his belief that financially and politically powerful Jews had weaponized Black poverty, creating a kind of noblesse oblige that prevented hardworking and productive white Americans from experiencing economic and cultural freedom. After Price had watched the video, he told his assistant to show him a graphical representation of the websites mentioning or linking to the post on Opinio. Any hope Price might have had that the story could be buried or overlooked was immediately dashed. He'd stood naked watching the graphic on his bedroom's far wall, which doubled as a giant computer screen. A medium-sized red circle in the center represented Opinio. Lines radiated outward from that central icon, each one terminating in a circle representing another site that had linked to the Opinio piece. Obscure websites were represented by tiny dots, while larger circles signified well-known sites with millions of readers. Many of those sites, in turn, had sprouted lines of their own, representing other pages linking to their mentions of the original Opinio, Opinio essay. The story was going viral, and Price had watched in near real time as it spread exponentially. He'd been lucky it was all happening in the middle of the night. More than likely, the true mathematics founders were asleep, as were other officers of the company. This bought Price time, maybe. The company would have no choice but to sever its relationship with Price, and then then everything would come crashing down. Price had lived beyond his means. Every tangible asset Price possessed had been bought on credit. And Price was about to not only lose his career, but also become unemployable and untouchable. Price had always been good at thinking on his feet, and now his terror had accelerated his thought processes. His swift actions had reflected his plan even before the plan was fully formed. The assistant had ears in every room of Price's condominium and could hear him as he tore through the home, pulling his clothes on and grabbing the items he'd need. Download my phone and laptop. Download to my phone and laptop every significant national, national news item from the United States, Europe, and all British territories from 1861 till present day, Price had barked at the assistant. You define significant, and all files must be locally accessible with no internet connection. The utility pants Price had pulled on had many pockets. As he'd hurriedly stuffed those pockets, he'd added, same request for significant local news items from San Francisco, same date range. Strapping on his shoulder holster and placing his Sig Sauer P320 in it, Price had placed four magazines in his pockets. Then another thought occurred to Price, and he removed from its display case his reproduction Borkhart C93 semi-automatic pistol. Price had never fired the weapon and was therefore not in the habit of cleaning and oiling it but he would gamble now on the proposition the gun was still in good working order. The sidearms accompanying reproduction 7.65 by 25 millimeter Borkhart cartridges were for display purposes only, but Price grabbed them too. As Price placed the items in his backpack, he issued another command. Download to my phone and laptop all significant scientific technical, and engineering papers from 1861 through today. You define significant. Though devoid of consciousness, the assistant was smart enough to simulate balking at his request. All of them, Johannes? It asked in the robot-sounding female voice, 
so popular for digital assistance. Your previous requests have used up significant portions of both devices' internal storages. Delete most audio, video, and photo files from the historic news items, Price responded. Keep text files only, except for stories about truly big events. You decide which ones. <clears throat> then Price added, use all remaining storage for aforementioned science, engineering, and tech papers. Omit what you must, but try not to skimp on anything from the 19th or 20th centuries involving anesthesiology or electronics. Price turned left on El Camino Real, continuing to agonize over the night's events while simultaneously going through a mental checklist to be sure he hadn't forgotten anything he'd need to make his plan work. Price was so lost in thought that in about a half mile, he realized he was not only missing his right turn on Ravenswood Avenue, but blowing through a red light. The car played a short buzzing alert sound and the screen on the dashboard conveyed a wireless message from the intersection's red light camera, informing him he'd been deemed. Price pulled over, closed his eyes, and breathed deeply. He realized it was strategically unwise to continue driving in his current state. An accident or an encounter with the police would create a disastrous delay. As with most things in Price's world, the premium sports car could be controlled with voice commands. Drive to work, Price told the vehicle. Eleven minutes later, the Berlinetta parked itself in Price's reserved spot in front of the True Mathematics building. Price grabbed his backpack off the passenger seat and strapped it on over his bomber jacket. In addition to the antique Borthard handgun, the backpack contained Price's phone, laptop computer, compact water purifier, and first aid kit. Sunrise was still at least two hours away. The company had some salaried employees who chose to come in before dawn, but probably not this early. Price approached the main entrance and waved his employee badge near the card reader. It didn't respond. Alarmed, Price rubbed his card directly on the card reader, something that shouldn't have been necessary. Now a red light lit up, and the device chirped an error tone at him. Price stood at the glass and chrome double doors and looked a question at the graveyard security man who was already coming around from behind the front desk. Price's breath fogged the glass as the uniformed guard unlocked the doors and opened one just a little. Um, uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Price, but we've been instructed not to let you in the building. Price said nothing. The guard stammered. Mm, uh, Mr. Morgan will be here at six o'clock. You could uh, talk to him. So the CEO had locked Price out without even talking to him first. This was galling, but perhaps not a complete surprise. Morgan was probably rallying his co-founder, chief legal officer, and director of human resources at this very moment, planning to be there when Price arrived at his normal time. The guard could have spoken to Price through the millimeter gap between the transparent double doors. Opening one door slightly had been a courtesy designed to avoid robbing Price of all his dignity. Price appreciated the gesture, but the guard would now regret his kindness. Price pushed the door further inward with his left hand and advanced into the lobby. The guard walked backwards, wide-eyed, putting his hands up in what might have been meant as a placating gesture. As Price advanced, he reached into his jacket, drew the Sig Sauer, and aimed it at the man. Price wasn't sure if he'd ever seen the guard before. He was white, possibly in his late thirties, with the type of weary continence Price associated with underachievers who'd settled for dead-end jobs. Like most security guards in the valley, the man was not armed. Using armed guards was simply not the done thing. 
Most tech companies sought to avoid the potential massive liability problems associated with having contract employees wield deadly force, and a guard could always call the police if necessary. So the guard had no weapon to draw, and Price imagined the man was probably expecting to be taken hostage. I'm sorry about this, Price said, and fired his gun. At the shooting range, the Sig Sauer had always sounded like a firecracker, but the acoustics of the lobby amplified the sound into a thunderclap that reverberated through the building before the guard hit the floor. Price removed the guard's employee badge from its lanyard belt clip, then rifled through the man's pockets and retrieved his building keys. Price knew there were other guards on duty, and they would have heard the gunshot. The front doors, having been unlocked and opened, would show on the guards' digital assistance, even if Price locked them now, so the guards would likely converge on the lobby. Price's pulse pounded almost audibly in his head as he jogged up the stairs to the mezzanine level. His breathing became rapid and labored as he badged a door open and entered a corridor. Price had truly passed the point of no return. Prior to firing that gun, Price had still possessed the option of continuing to live his life. Price would have been destitute and socially outcast, and might also have been prosecuted when his use of company funds to cover personal debts was discovered, but Price would have still had some kind of life, a terrible downgraded life, but a life. As Price traversed the hallways, badging himself through additional doors, going inwards toward the heart of the facility, his field of vision seemed to tilt as if the world itself were off kilter. One decision can change your whole life, Price thought. Finally, Price arrived at the room the company had humorously dubbed the Sanctum Centorium. The guard's badge unlocked the glass outer door which slid aside into the wall, just like the doors on spaceships in science fiction movies. Most employee badges could not unlock the doors to this sanctum, but for safety reasons, the security staff had access. What was inside had not yet been revealed to the world, but in the unlikely event a guard had entered, he or she could not possibly recognize the room's most exotic contents for what they were. Price entered the airlock and the door reclosed behind him. There were cameras in every ceiling and the surviving security staff was surely watching Price at this point. The airlock was designed to keep dust and germs out. It would offer no resistance to the police who were surely en route if not already entering the building. Price opened the inner door and stepped through. There it was, the time machine. The clean room's floor space was roughly equivalent to that of a high school gymnasium, with a ceiling high enough that the room occupied three stories of the building. In the center was a small circular raised stage coated in a highly reflective material. Perched above the stage was a large black machine on stilts, Spider-like, it resembled the complicated multi-lens projectors that had been used in planetariums before advances in curved wall screen technology rendered them obsolete. The machine was much larger than a planetarium projector, however, and its height was what had necessitated the use of a space with such a tall ceiling. Thick, heavily insulated power cables extended from one corner of the room running up one leg of the giant spider and connecting to its body. Other than this, the rest of the room was quite unremarkable. The stage and unusual machine were surrounded by two rings of computer workstations, all facing inward. Price had always wanted the space to look something like a NASA mission control room, with purpose-built computer terminals, giant wall screens, myriad flashing lights, and lots of technicians concentrating intensely while speaking into their headsets. Instead, the workstations and chairs were off-the-shelf items from Office Depot, bearing perfectly mundane-looking desktop 
computers. The scene had always reminded Price of the kind of avant-garde theater space where the seats are arranged in circles around the stage, allowing the performers to be viewed from every angle. Anything placed on this stage would give only one type of performance, a disappearing act, unless, of course, it has been previously placed on the stage and sent back from the future, in which case it would appear rather than disappear. Price had never possessed an aptitude for math, physics, philosophy, or anything or any other thing that might have prevented his head from hurting when he thought about the logistics of time travel. No, getting smart people together and enabling them to work their magic was Price's talent. He'd always loved to make deals, promote things, and be entrepreneurial. Price didn't need to understand how time travel worked. He had only needed to convince the right investors that his people might really be able to do it. Price's hand shook as he threw the large switch that would send power to the machine. The device's low, resonant hum quietly filled the room. It was a sound easily drowned out by loud conversation, and its subtlety seemed to convey the black metal arachnid's awesome, world-changing power. It was as if the machine was saying, I don't have to make a lot of noise. You know what I can do. Price removed his backpack, set it on the floor, and sat at one of the computers. Other than typing in his username and password, most of what Price needed to do could be accomplished by pointing and clicking. Price was the furthest thing from an expert, but the operations team had previously granted him the ceremonial honor of operating the machine during one of its inaugural tests. As Price clicked various items on the interface, his phone suddenly began to ring from within his backpack. The sound was jarring, shrill, and alarming. This would be the police, who'd surely surrounded the building. The security staff had no doubt retrieved Price's phone number from the employee directory, or perhaps Morgan had provided it. The police would be calling in the hope they could talk him into surrendering himself. Price thought of answering the phone in order to buy himself some time. No. No, no, no. Price needed to focus. He reached into the backpack and turned the phone off. Price should have powered the phone down much sooner in order to conserve its battery, but the thing was less than a year old and a top-of-the-line model, boasting a battery life measured in years. By the time his phone was ready to die, Price might very well have gotten some smart people together in a room and convinced them to build him something capable of recharging the device. The interface Price worked with was a marvel of elegant simplicity. He knew there were a maddening number of complicated settings and equations that needed to be adjusted each time the machine was used, but the interface distilled them all into just two top-level questions, when and where. Price understood space and time were somehow inextricably linked, that one did not travel in space or in time, but in space-time. Nevertheless, the interface asked the user for two separate settings. When was one set of coordinates, and where was the other? The when part was much easier for Price to grasp because it was perfectly linear. Physicists might claim time was a circle, hologram, curved line, or any number of other weird things, but the interface only required the user to imagine time as a straight line and choose where on the line he wanted to send something. Beneath the graphical user interface, the system could allow the user to type commands that would select a teraannum, gigaannum, megaannum, millennium, century, year, month, day, hour, minute, second, millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond, picosecond, and femtosecond. Thankfully, the window Price was working with kept things much simpler, only asking for a year, month, date, hour, minute, and second. 
the where part was far more complicated because it could not be imagined as a straight line. Geography and geometry were additional fields Price had never truly grasped, and as simplified as the location window might have been, it still asked for a baffling array of coordinates in more than three dimensions. Price would have to roll the dice and not adjust the location. The true mathematics campus wasn't built on landfill like the offices and laboratories east of the Bayshore Freeway, so Price wasn't in danger of appearing in the bay, dozens of meters from the shoreline. If Price materialized in a redwood tree, the result would be catastrophic, but he simply had no time to figure out the location settings in order to minimize that risk. So the where of things was Menlo Park. Regardless of which calendar date he chose, Price would go on a long journey to this exact spot 30 miles south of San Francisco. Traveling to the future was out of the question. Having no information on future events, Price couldn't be sure this space wouldn't be replaced by some new building with different dimensions, and materializing in space occupied by a wall would be just as deadly as trying to occupy a tree's space. Furthermore, traveling to the future would only confer disadvantages. The time projector would retain a record of its most recent settings, so Price would materialize surrounded by people aware of his crimes and expecting his arrival. Even without that problem, what advantage could a man from the past possibly have? Regardless of where in the future Price appeared, he would show up ignorant of history and possessing no knowledge or technology not already possessed by that era's natural inhabitants. So, the past it would be. The question of when was an interesting one. Earlier, Price had briefly, but not seriously, entertained a fantasy in which he did the local Native Americans a favor, arrived prior to the European conquest, and warned them of the coming invasion. This could have involved arriving just prior to Columbus's 1492 sea voyage, but Columbus and his contemporaries had spent so much time mired in the islands, or the Central American mainland, that Price arriving in 1491 would have felt like Price arriving unnecessarily early. In a more reasonable and relevant version of the fantasy, Price had imagined himself appearing in 1759 making contact with the Ohlone, teaching them how to speak English, and upgrading their weapons technology. On November 1st, 1769, when Jose Francisco Ortega climbed to the top of Sweeney Ridge and discovered the San Francisco Bay, Price and his band of Indians, now a capable military force, would be waiting for him. They would decapitate Ortega, and instruct the surviving members of his party to carry a message back to Gaspar de Portola. Tell the governor that Alta California belongs to me, Price imagined himself saying. Tell him our hills and deserts have rich gold and silver deposits, but Spaniards will never see them without paying tribute to my army. As a boy, Price had been bullied, abused, and neglected by the students and staff of a middle school bearing Ortega's name. Killing Ortega would have felt like some great cosmic reckoning, like a long overdue act of revenge that, amazingly, would prevent the original grievance from ever happening. Those harms in Price's personal history would never come to pass, and yet they had, and would always be, this was because the grandfather paradox did not exist. Prior to true mathematics founding, some deep thinkers had asserted that if you were a time traveler, you did not have to worry you might go back, you might go back in time, accidentally kill your grandfather, and thus prevent yourself from ever existing. They claimed if you killed your grandfather prior to your own birth, the moment at which you had arrived in the past became the moment you sprang into existence, fully formed with intact memories of an alternate timeline, which would now never be. 
but upon which your existence no longer depended. The company had conducted experiments validating this theory, without killing anybody, of course. It would be a while before Price could even begin to process his feelings about the homicide he'd just committed, but he believed the moment he stepped into the past, he would set in motion a timeline where that security guard would never be killed but would also be born into different circumstances than the ones he'd experienced in this world, if he were still to be born at all. Price could not believe the mere act of traveling in time could split the universe in two, creating alternate timelines that would exist alongside each other. The idea of a multiverse was just too ridiculous and fanciful. Regardless, the timeline Price was fleeing would be completely inaccessible from the one he would enter. Even if the original timeline still existed in some place other than Price's memory, it might as well not. New sounds appeared over the low hum of the time machine. Price heard the dull thuds of booted footfalls and the muted sounds of men yelling indistinctly. Though an airlock protected the large windowless room, its walls contained no special insulation against sound. Police officers were in the building. Price got up and stood directly beneath an inverted dome in the ceiling, which contained the room's security cameras. He fired a tight cluster of three rounds into the device, which rained metal, plastic, and glass debris. Price hated to lose bullets and risk damaging the time machine with a ricochet, <clears throat> but he needed to deprive the police of the ability to see into the room, and the loud gunshots would give them pause. Price retrieved his backpack from the floor, leaned over the workstation, and clicked the icon that would activate the system's natural speech assistant. Like so many things in Price's world, the time projector could be controlled with voice commands. Can you hear me? Price asked. <clears throat> yes, the system replied in another variation on the ubiqui uh, ubiquitous robot sounding female voice. I'm going to enter a date, but I will not be in front of the computer when it's time to send, Price told the artificial intelligence. Therefore, I want you to send when I speak the words Sunwheel. Do you understand? Yes. The machine replied, send will commence when user says sun wheel. Now his decision would become real. As much as Price had enjoyed his fantasy about leading the Indians who would revere him as a godlike savior, he would have felt too isolated being the only white man among thousands of natives. Price enjoyed thinking of them as Indians and not Native Americans for the same reason he'd liked Chloe or Zoe, wearing a bindi and Hindu-themed outfit, despite her being white. If the social justice warriors said you weren't allowed to do something, Price felt you were serving the greater good by doing whatever that thing was. His covert belief in the principles of white separatism notwithstanding, Price bore the Indians no ill will, but Price's beliefs rested on foundations led laid by the French aristocrat, Count Joseph Arthur de Gobineau, de Gobineau, and the Nazi theorist, Alfred Rosenberg. He therefore regarded Indians as belonging to a lower order of man. And had a price expended enough time and energy adjusting to other cultures? Indeed, from the very moment the plan had begun to form, one date had burned in Price's mind. Price leaned over the computer terminal again, hands now trembling as much with excitement as with terror and trauma. Price entered the date, April 12th, 1861. Then Price strode with confidence toward the raised circular stage in the center of the room. This was the first time he'd felt truly self-assured since the whole crazy emergency had begun. Price again heard the sound of men yelling indistinctly and saw movement on the far side of the airlock's glass doors. The airlock was narrow enough the police would be forced to enter almost in single file, Price thought, 
and he assumed they'd be cautious about doing so, lest they make easy targets of themselves. But whatever the cops were planning, it would happen soon. Price's destination made perfect sense. 1861 was early enough that the scientific and technical information he bore would come as powerful revelations. But 1861 was also so recent, some of the, in, some of the era's inhabitants would be learned enough to understand what Price offered and have the skills and resources to do something about it. And in 1861, Price would find himself among English-speaking Americans in a culture he understood. More to the point, April 12th, 1861, was the day Southern forces began the Civil War by firing upon Fort Sumter. Price imagined that news from the East Coast might be slow to reach Northern California. He knew Western Union's transcontinental telegraph service wouldn't link San Francisco to Washington, D.C. prior to October 1861. So word of the momentous conflict in Charleston could take a while to reach the busy port city. How long would it take Price to reach San Francisco was another question. A map and route query had indicated a person in the present day could hike from Menlo Park to San Francisco in 10.5 hours of uninterrupted walking, but Price doubted the proposed route would exist in 1861. El Camino Real would exist in some unpaved form, but Price was unsure as to whether the road's location back then would be the same as in the present. Regardless, Price knew he couldn't hike 30 miles in one day. Just making the journey on horseback in those days had surely been a grueling all-day affair. Price assumed he would appear in a woodland area, or perhaps a marsh, and have to hike east or west before he found El Camino or some other road. Then he would try to find somebody with a horse or horse-drawn wagon to give him a ride. Price figured the multi-tool he carried, or his wristwatch, would be sufficient barter to secure transportation. He hoped so, anyway, because he was traveling light and couldn't spare many of the other things he carried. Price would, of course, require food and lodging, but he could not conceive of himself hiring on somewhere as a laborer. If his plan hadn't developed on the spur of the moment, if Price had had the luxury of a few days head start, he could have visited an antique coin dealer and stocked up on vintage currency from the era. But had this plan already existed in some abstract form, if Price was being completely honest with himself, had in Price's daydreams and fantasies mapped the path he now followed, long before this night's crisis had forced him into motion, Price would go to San Francisco, identifying, identify people of means sympathetic to the Confederacy, and convince them to send him to the South with funds and letters of introduction. Persuading them would not be difficult. Showing a person one video clip on his phone or laptop would prove Price had come from the future. Price wanted to be careful about revealing himself, however, and had in mind some subtler strategies. Spiritualism, seances, automatic writing, and Ouija boards would not capture the public consciousness until after the Civil War, but Price assumed the San Francisco of 1861 contained at least a few well-heeled socialites who believed in psychic powers and talking to the dead. Price would find such people and privately disclose to them prophecies of the very near future. Soon as stories consistent with Price's predictions appeared in the papers, his marks would be convinced of his supernatural powers. And then Price would have his patrons. He imagined he could extract enough wealth from such benefactors to finance a southward journey even without identifying Confederate sympathizers. Price knew it would be impossible to reach Montgomery before the Confederate States of America moved its capital to Richmond, but he thought he might make it, he might make for Montgomery anyway. Traveling to either city by land would be hellish 
but Montgomery was closer. Price wasn't sure which city would be easier to reach by sea, but he knew a ship journey would be another kind of ordeal. Had Price been interested only in enriching himself, remaining in the North and aiding the Union would have been far less trouble and just as lucrative. But Price cared about the greater good, and the prospect of changing the outcome of the Civil War was an opportunity from which he could not shrink. He had so much to offer. The Sig Sauer would demonstrate the stunning advantage of a self-loading pistol that didn't need to be cocked before each pull of the trigger, but its internal mechanisms and machining would be hard to emulate using mid-19th century processes. The Borkhart C-93 in Price's backpack, however, was a precise reproduction of a gun designed in 1893. It had been the world's first semi-automatic pistol, and when Price presented it to President Jefferson Davis, General Robert E. Lee, or some other Confederate official, they would immediately see the possibility of it. The Borkhart would be easy to understand, reverse engineer, and manufacture. And then there were the Confederate battle losses. Price would describe the staggering death tolls at places like Antietam, explain what had gone wrong, and thus enable the South to avoid those failures. The gratitude Price would receive from the Confederate generals and elected officials would be indescribable. And what a glorious experiment this would be. Would slavery naturally fall by the wayside, even after Confederate victory? Some writers denigrated, den, denigrated as revisionists believed the institution would have soon been phased out even with no war. The thought that hundreds of thousands of American boys and men had been slaughtered or maimed to achieve an outcome that would have arrived anyway was deeply offensive to Price's sense of morality. How many lives would be saved by a quick, decisive Southern victory? Time would tell. Price stepped up onto the highly reflective stage. It occurred to him to strap his backpack on, but he didn't want to take the time. Holding the backpack straps in his right hand, Price addressed the room in a grand, commanding voice. Sunwheel! Nothing happened. Price was about to demand an explanation when the system's robot girl voice said, Caution! Location values have not been entered. Yes, I know. Price bit back, trying to control his voice. We are going to send without adjusting the location. Do you understand? Yes, the system replied. The airlock's doors slid open and a deep, electronically amplified male voice filled the sanctum. Mr. Price, I need you to throw your gun across the room and get down on the floor, face down, hands away from your body. Price could see a SWAT operator in thick black body armor on the other side of the airlock, flattened against a wall using the narrow frame of the outer door as a partial blind. Price couldn't see the other operators, but could feel them, poised to invade the room. A flashbang grenade or tear gas would surely precede their incursion, leaving Price disoriented and the time machine potentially damaged and inoperable. Some crazed, fearful part of Price commandeered his inner voice, urging him to give up. While he still could, Price ignored the panic trying to bloom within him. He stood erect, looking right at the SWAT operator, and proudly spoke the words, Sunwheel! Everything went black and silent, just as Price had expected. Motion pictures and virtual reality experiences always subjected viewers to dazzling light shows when depicting time travel, but reality was quite the opposite. True mathematics had not yet sent a person through time, but they'd sent a camera, and its audio and video recordings had borne out what the theorists had predicted. Light and sound waves depended on time, 
and could not be perceived by a viewer traveling outside the figurative medium of space-time. So Price was not at all surprised by the abrupt moment of no light and no sound, but then suddenly there were light sources and everything was shockingly violent and strange. Urine and gas evacuated Price's body, but he barely noticed because his lungs felt like they were on fire and trying to push his esophagus and tongue through his teeth. For a fraction of an instant, Price tried to believe this might be a normal, if unexpected, part of the time sinned experience. But then Price's backpack floated up before his eyes. The backpack was a black silhouette against the backdrop of light sources, which also moved upward, relative to Price's point of view. Dear God, they looked like, they couldn't be. It couldn't be. Then a massive reddish orange curved line scrolled up into Price's field of view. Everything below the line was black and blocking the backdrop of pinprick light sources. Price realized then he was looking at the corona of the earth, which was between him and the sun. Even as this realization came, Price's vision fogged, depriving him of the most majestic view he'd ever experienced. Were his eyes desiccating as their surface water boiled off, or had the water rapidly frozen? Price was only peripherally aware of the question. The cold, unthinking computer girl voice rang out in Price's mind. Caution, location values have not been entered. Of course, of course, of course, of course. There were processional changes in Earth's orbit. So much so, it was probably sheer happenstance Price had even appeared close enough to have a view of the planet. Price continued to tumble, but his vision was so clouded he couldn't even see the stars transiting his field of view. What a fool. 